Tomorrow morning. All right, so we <clears throat> last week we were talking about um, differences between arteries and veins and blood vessels. We went through uh, the three layers that are present in blood vessels, like the tunica media, the tunica intima, the tunica externa, or the adventitia, depending on how you will, which textbook you're reading. And we talked about the differences between arteries and veins in, within those tunics. We talked about the, the structure of capillaries. We talked about different, different types of capillaries. And we talked about blood flow, all right? So we left off talking about blood flow, all right? And how blood flows through the vessels. And what do we know about blood flow through arteries? Danny, it's away from the heart. And then blood flow through the veins is towards the heart. And what do we know about the structure of veins in that's different from the structure of arteries that assists in the flow of blood? Valves. They have valves that prevent backflow, okay? So now we're talking about flow, so arteries to arterioles to capillaries to veins, or venules and veins, and we talked about the pressure that's involved uh, within uh, the capillaries that pushes fluid out of capillaries and allows for exchange to occur. All right, and today we're going to talk about local blood flow. How does blood flow change? How is it regulated? And then we're going to go into blood pressure. Okay, so we talked about capillaries and the, and the normal flow of blood from arteries, arterioles to capillaries to venules to veins. That's the simple pathway, right? And we talked about alternative pathways of blood flow as well, the an anastomoses and shunted pathways, okay? So if there was no, if there was always blood flowing in that simple way, we wouldn't have to talk about how the difference is, okay? And it's important also to note that your body regulates how blood flows through vessels, all right? We talked about one of those ways is the shunted pathway to Precapillary sphincters close off and they shunt blood from the arterial side directly over to the venial, venial side, the venous side, okay? So that's an example of regulating local blood flow, all right? So not all capillaries are filled simultaneously. They're not all filled all the time, okay? So how do we measure this and how is it regulated? Local blood flow varies, okay? Someone, do, does anyone know anyone who has Raynaud's disease? Okay, what is that? What's one of the symptoms of Raynaud's disease? Your extremities get really cold. Your extremities get really cold because they have higher overactive sympathetic nervous stimulation that causes the capillaries to be shut off. So blood's not flowing through there as well, right? Local blood flow is, is changed, and that changes like the heat and the cold, okay? So local blood flow is dependent upon a couple different things, okay? First, the degree of tissue vascularity. What do you think that means? What's vascularity? The amount of blood that gets to a certain area, the amount of like arteries or vessels. All right, so vascularity talks about the arteries and the vessels that are present, okay? so. Tissues have different amounts of blood vessels. Some tissues have more, some tissues have less, right? Give me an example of a tissue that has, that has, would be, has lots of vasculature, has lots of blood vessels. And crickets, nobody, nothing. The brain, okay, lots of blood vessels. Skeletal muscle, lots of blood vessels. Can we compare that with something that you talked about last semester, talked about tissues, that does not have a lot of blood vessels? Cartilage, ligaments, tendons, they don't have a lot of blood vessels, okay? Because, so that degree of vascularity, obviously there's a difference in the amount of blood that flows through there. What do you also know about the amount, the healing process of those two things, a skeletal muscle versus a, a cartilage or a ligament. Ligament and cartilage, they heal much slower, okay? 
We're going to talk, so degree of vascularity, okay? So the extent of vessels in the tissue, other things that are metabolically active, such as the brain, skeletal muscle, heart, liver, the spleen, right? The spleen does something, it cleans up blood. Do you think it has, it cleans out uh, old red blood cells? Does it have a, a high degree of vascular, vascularity? Yes or no? Do you think? What's its job? What's the function of the spleen? I just told you what the function of the spleen was. Thanks, Colin. It cleans up old blood cells, okay? It cleans up old blood cells. So does it have a lot of vascularity? Yes, it does, okay? Where are blood cells made? In the bone marrow. So do bones, do, do bones have a high degree of vascularity? Yes, they do, okay? So if you can, can, if you can think about the function of the tissues, and what they do, right? So metabolically active, they need nutrients all the time, they need oxygen, they need stuff to do, okay? They need materials to do their job. They're gonna have lots of blood vessels. Other stuff, tendons, ligaments, epithelial tissue, right? There's, you, what do you know about epithelial tissue? One of the characteristics of it, it's avascular. Your skin cells on the top are, have no blood vessels, okay? Cartilage, the cornea, the lens of the eye, Etc. are examples with very little blood, all right, blood cells. Now, your blood cells, for the most part, they, they are, are mainly stagnant, okay? So if you were just to go through life and, and not do too much and to, to influence an increase or a regression in the formation of blood cells, they're there, all right? They tend not to go away, all right? But there are times where you will create new blood vessels. You get a cut, you get an injury, you'll create new blood vessels, you'll clear out the damaged ones, okay? There are also times where those blood cells will regress, okay? The formation of new blood cells is a process called angiogenesis, okay? When we talked about clearing out a, a blockage of a blood vessel, what was that process called? What was that procedure called? Stenting, but it had to do with something. What was it? It was, anyone have angioplasty? Right? Angio is a, is a prefix that refers to blood vessels. Okay? So angiogenesis is the production of new blood vessels. Okay? It occurs over time. Examples. You start aerobic training or weightlifting, right? Resistance training. You're going to create new muscle. When you create new muscle, it influences the production of new blood cells. It stimulates angiogenesis, okay? At the same time, opposite to that, or analogous to that, you sit around, you eat a bunch of food, and you gain weight. You gain fat tissue, okay? That also stimulates the production of new blood cells because those new cells, they need nutrients too, okay? so. Adipose tissue would stimulate angiogenesis. Okay, coronary vessels in in response to a local blockage, they will kind of find other pathways. They'll grow out. That's stimulation of new blood vessels. All right. On the sec on the opposite to that, those blood vessels can also regress in response to the cessation of of weight training. All right. Someone gets really big, and you see football players, you know, and then after they stop training. That muscle goes away, right? It atrophies. And after it atrophies, those, those blood vessels regress, okay? You lose weight, okay? You lose adipose tissue, those blood vessels regress, okay? And in some cases, why is it important that that tissue is stimulating the production of new blood vessels? More tissue, more blood vessels. What is that blood vessel the source of for them? Nutrients, right? They're, that's the, the source of nutrients, the source of oxygen, the source of glucose, the, the way to get rid of wastes, okay? And in some cases, angiogenesis, we don't want to happen, okay? And tumor angiogenesis is the big one, okay? Cancer cells are, are cells that grow just like yours, 
just like normal cells, all right? Maybe too fast and uncontrolled, but they still need the same things that your normal cells need to grow. They need oxygen. They need to get rid of waste. They need glucose. They need growth factors. Where do they get them? The same place your normal cells get them, from the blood, right? So tumor cells will also stimulate the production of angiogenesis, of new blood vessels, okay? So this is a way, a way, a way of targeting tumor cells, right? This is a, a big area of research in, in cancer uh, therapy. How can we selectively cut off the connection to the supply? How can we starve out tumor cells so that they die off while the normal cells continue to grow, right? If we can, if we can stop that, we can help control the growth of tumors, okay? So a way of starving the tumor. So here you have a tumor, right? Small localized tumor, but it's producing a bunch of signaling molecules that are stimulating the production of these blood vessels, right? So now that's a very rich tumor environment, okay? It's a nutrient rich environment in, within the tumor, allows the tumor to grow faster than the normal cells around it, right? More nutrients there, et cetera. Okay, and that's common. That's a common step in the progression of cancer. Okay, so angiogenesis. You get a small localized tumor. It now in, stimulates angiogenesis. Now it goes to another another level. Right. A lot of times you'll hear stages. You'll hear cancer stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. They grade them based on these steps. Whether it's localized, whether it's starting to increase blood vessel formation, if it starts to be moved to lymph nodes, if it's metastatic to other places, and there's a whole grading process. Okay? Other things that, so angiogenesis, production or regression of, of blood vessels uh, will influence local blood flow. The myogenic response, okay? Smooth muscle is will help regulate the flow of blood through the through the vessels. Which layer of the, which tunic will you find the smooth muscle? Where is smooth muscle located within the blood vessels? Okay. All right, so the myogenic response. If blood goes in, all right, to arterioles where it's gonna help regulate pressure, it's going to, it's going to work, the, the muscle of the vessel is going to work to keep the flow of blood con continuous, okay? So if pressure goes way up, more blood is gonna be pushed into the arterioles faster, the arterioles dilate and let the, blow of the, let the flow of blood continue. If pressure goes down, the vessels constrict to help maintain pressure, okay? So there's less stretch, all right? So the smooth vessel re relaxes and it helps return blood flow, all right? So we always want to have an adequate amount of flow, kind of regulate an amount of blood going through the vessels as possible. Yes, sir. I'm confused. Okay. Say if blood pressure rises and the smooth muscle contracts, then isn't it the opposite of what you've said? So they will work. At first, it will contract. Okay. If that pressure stays high, arterial, let's say, let's say systemic pressure stays high, they will relax to keep blood pressure at a regular, at a regular rate. All right. But let's think about it like this. If my daughter's a softball pitcher, okay, one of her drills she does is she does this, right? She swings her arm around as fast as she can three, four, five times. What's happening to blood in her arm? Gravity is pushing it where? Down towards the hand, okay? So in the arterioles in the hand, now this is local, right? So I was thinking confusion goes from systemic versus local. Localized, you're going to have it here, and there's flow going through. So now there's higher pressure. 
it's going to relax the arterioles there are going to relax to keep blood flowing through okay so that's the difference okay other questions all right so myogenic response short-term re <coughs> regulation okay vasodilation and vasoconstriction okay vasodilators what do they do and what does that what does that do to flow of blood increase. increase flow good job and vasoconstriction will decrease the diameter of a blood vessel and help will also decrease the rate of flow through the vessel okay so and you could do this in different areas um, athletic trainers do you know where uh, topical vasodilators vasoconstrictors like what icy hot, icy hot. okay so uh, you've all used Ben Gay, right? All it is is a topical analgesic, right? It's a cream that goes on, but it helps regulate blood flow, right? It helps regulate blood flow. And it's a vasodilator, vasoconstrictor as examples, all right? So the increased flow to the areas, right, to, to capillaries, all right? And there's also some autoregulation, okay? Think about what is the blood bringing to the tissue? nutrients okay so if a cell needs more oxygen it's going to release vasodilators to get more blood to the area okay <clears throat> when tissue activity increases okay i have a i had a little infection on my elbow the last week okay i had to take some antibiotics a little bacterial infection it was swollen and red, why? What's happening? Oh, the, you, are my athletic trainers know. You got MRSA. No. Yeah. What? The blood flow has just increased the area. Blood flow's increased to the area, but why is blood flow increased to the area too? Give me reasons. It's part of the inflammatory. It's inflammatory response. All right, and we have increase of there's a bacteria that's there. The immune cells are recognizing that and releasing uh, vasodilators. Okay, there's a lot of tissue activity that's going on. The immune cells are, are run, running into bacteria. They're being recruited to the area, okay, to get, remove bacteria that are, are growing in, within the skin, okay? So more tissue activity, more activity means more nutrient requirements, right? So that is, leads right into the inflammatory response. You have redness, swelling, it's warm, right? And a little bit of pain, okay? And so as perfusion, what's perfusion again? What's perfusion? What do you think perfusion is? It's the amount of blood that's flowing through the, through the vessels, okay? And it, it, perfusion refers to the exchange of nutrients, all right? If blood is flowing through capillaries, there's nutrient exchange, that's perfusion, okay? So there's a negative feedback. So let's say a, a tissue needs more, needs how, or has increased uh, metabolic activity increase tissue activity of the cells, they increase and they, they vasodilate vessels. But as blood flows through the area, now you've, you've met that exchange requirement, now what? Now, the vet, now we go backwards, the, vaso the, the vessels constrict and perfusion, the amount of blood flowing through the vessels goes down. Okay, so it's kind of, once you meet the requirement, then we can kind of stop the flow of blood through the area and get back to normal, le re uh, normal levels, okay? Reactive hyperemia. So it's increase in blood flow after it is temporarily disrupted. You're going to do this in lab this week, all right? You're going to check blood pressure. How many of you have ever had your blood pressure taken? Awesome, okay? So you put it on your left, left arm and it, the cuff goes over right and then you it, it cuts off and stops the brachial artery 
It stops blood from flowing down through the end of the, end of the arm. Okay? And if you leave it on there long enough, maybe longer than you're going to take your blood pressure reading, when you take it off, what happens? Your arm feels really warm because blood's rushing in through there. All those cells have been starved for a little while of the nutrients that they need. So they're reacting and in causing an over amount of blood being pushed through the area. All right? It's an increase in blood flow after it's temporarily disrupted. Okay? So it's additional blood to help resupply oxygen, nutrients, and eliminate, eliminate waste. It's still the same thing that blood's doing. Okay, the vessels are controlling the flow of blood in response to the needs of the cells and the tissues around it. Okay, so if you need to get rid of more waste, get, stuff goes through. Right? I, at home, when uh, Christmas falls on a Thursday, Thursday's garbage day for me. Okay, so, and I said I picked out Christmas for a reason. What do we have to do the day after Christmas? Huh? You throw out Christmas, return Christmas gifts. Yeah, no, but I have to throw out wrapping paper and I have, I have more garbage to get rid of, right? And if, if on Thursday is a holiday, they don't come around on Thursday, they come around the day after, right? And then everyone else, the normal Friday day. So what happens? More garbage trucks have to go through the area to clear out the rest of the stuff, eliminate the, all the waste, okay? The same thing, it's analogous to what's happening here. You have to clear out more flow to, to deliver nutrients and clear out waste, okay? And then we have already talked about inflammation and tissue damage, okay? And some others, so you have a couple uh, examples of vasodilators, histamine, bradykine, nitric oxide, all right? And prostaglandins and thromboxanes are also uh, vasodilators, right? So when you take aspirin, right, it stops the production. It's an anti-thromboxane inhibitor, okay? So it helps stop inflammation by preventing the production of those, vi those vasodilators, okay? And then we get to total blood flow, okay? Total blood flow is altogether how much blood is being pumped through this closed system. And what's the pump? The heart. And how much blood is the heart pumping? What is that called? How much, what the volume of the, the volume of blood the heart is pumping every minute. What is that called? Cardiac output, output which is related to stroke volume and heart rate. Okay? So total blood flow normally at rest should be equal to cardiac output. Right? If the if, without any blockages or, or cutoffs or autoregulation, et cetera, that could occur. Total blood flow should equal cardiac output, okay? This could increase with exercise. What happens when you exercise? What happens to cardiac output when you exercise? Increases. It increases. So you would obviously need to increase blood flow in response to cardiac output. Exercise, your skeletal muscles need more nutrients, they need more oxygen, they need to get rid of more waste, so you meet that demand, okay? And so, regulation of flow through the vessels is a function of the pump, the heart rate, cardiac output, and the vessels through which the pump goes through, okay? So it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a function of the heart and the vessels together. Okay? So you can regulate flow. Which leads directly into blood pressure. Okay? Because the pump is going to push a volume of fluid through a closed system. Okay? And volume and pressure are directly related. Okay? They have a proportional relationship. So blood pressure is defined as the force of blood against a vessel wall. So if I have a vessel, I'm talking about the force of the blood that is pushing out against that vessel, okay? It's pushing out.
liquid is a state of matter that will assume its position of the container it's in. Okay? So same thing with blood. But if you push too much in, it wants to go out. Okay? And because there's a certain pump that's going to drive blood through the clo closed system, and then it returns back, that volume returns back to the heart, we have what's called a blood pressure gradient. Pressure is higher in the arteries than it is in the venous system. Okay? And as it gets closer, as blood return, the vessels go back towards the heart, pressure is much lower. Okay? So there's changes from one end, the beginning of the systemic circulation from the left ventricle to the aorta, to the other end of the vessels, the venous system. All right, and there's actually changes from one vessel, from the arteries to arterioles, from the beginning of a vessel to the end of a vessel, okay? So pressure is the highest in arteries and the lowest in veins. Blood pressure in the vena cava is zero. Zero to like five milli millimeters of mercury, okay? That's very low. In the aorta, it's somewhere around 93, 90 to 95, let's say, okay? So that, that's the gradient that we have, okay? And we talk about, you're gonna measure in lab this week, and what we're gonna talk about, arterial blood pressure. We can't measure blood pressure on veins because it's too low to measure, right? And on the artery side, it's closer to the heart, where the pump is origi originating the force and pushing blood out, that's where you have that stretch that occurs, okay? More pressure every time a, uh, there's a systolic uh, ventricular contraction, more volume is pushed into the system and you end up with a higher pressure, okay? So blood flow in artery pulses with the cardiac cycle, right? So that's why we read a pulse, and we'll see, we'll talk about that in a second, we read a pulse, you put your head, your, your hand or finger on an artery, and you can feel the pulse of fluid being pushed into the closed system. And there's a little stretch of that blood vessel. Okay? That is what we call a pulse pressure. All right? So we have two pressure readings, systolic and diastolic. Systolic is the top number. So if I had a nice 120 over 80, this is milligrams of mercury, okay? The top number is systolic, the bottom number is diastolic. What do I mean by systolic? That pressure in the artery when what happens? <coughs> systole. Contraction of the ventricles. That's when the left and right ventricle are contracting and pushing, ejecting blood out into the closed system, okay? So pressure goes up. More volume in to a closed container, pressure goes up, okay? Now the ventricles relax, and blood starts pooling into the ventricles, and we start to relieve pressure, okay? And that's why you have your diastolic pressure. It's when it's under relaxation, so diastole. So here's your blood pressure. What's occurring? Your brachial arteries is going to be what we call occluded or cut off. All right, we're going to shut that off through the pressure of the cuff when it inflates. And then as it goes through, every pulse, systolic pressure, will stretch that artery. That little bit of that amount, that pressure that it takes to stretch their artery can be measured. We measure that by... Um, blood pressure reading. All right, so normal is 120 over 80. None of you will probably have a 120 over 80, right? That's the, the textbook de definition of normal, okay? And then, so how does this work? So you, you, pr you inflate the cuff and it cuts off the pressure and you start to deflate it. And as it starts to deflate, what happens? The heart's still beating and once it, once the heart beats, to a point where it overcomes the pressure of the cuff and can start to push blood through, you can start to hear the sounds with the stethoscope. All right, you take the first, that's your first reading. 
That's when the pressure of the vessel, inside the vessel, overcomes what's on the cuff. That's your systolic pressure. And then it continues. You still make a couple more sounds. And as blood starts, starts to flow through, normally those sounds go away and you can actually take the last reading. That's your diastolic pressure. Okay? So once it starts to laminate or flow, it goes through. And so those sounds we're talking about is that the, they go through the vessel, right? And when it's, when it's cut off, when the vessel is like pinched off like this, blood can't flow through. All right? Blood doesn't, doesn't go through the vessel. But when you open it back up, it starts to whirl around. Okay? It starts to whirl around. And that's the sound you hear we call carotid cough sound. Right? When you listen to the, to the vein or to the artery and the blood f whirling through, it's causing a sound that's similar to the heart rate, heartbeat. And then it, when it stops, now what ends up happening when this is all open again, blood can flow through freely and it doesn't make any more sounds. Okay? So you're listening, that's the, now you're in your diastolic pressure. Okay? The difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure is what we call, is your pulse pressure, okay? So, so normally, is systolic over diastolic is 120 over 80, so a normal pulse pressure is 40, right? The difference between systolic versus diastolic, and that's your pulse pressure. So if you take a pulse, you can all use one of your uh, pulse points that are on here, Right, mine. Uh, one of the when I get headaches, I get migraines pretty often, and I can feel my pulse in my head right here on the the, the you know, superficial temporal artery. Okay, it goes right here. You can do it in the facial one, right? Or I'll, uh, most of the time, it's the left common carotid. Okay, you can do the brachial underneath the arm, the femoral, and there's different pulse points that are common for children versus infants versus adults, okay? Most of the time, the radial artery is one that's used for everyone, right? But when you feel that, that pulse, which is equal to your heartbeat, it is a pressure of that artery stretching when there's systolic and then recoiling when there's relaxation, okay? Stretch when, when there's contraction of the ventricle and relaxation when it's relaxed. Okay, so that's how a pulse is equal to your heart rate. Okay? Questions on pulse or blood pressure up to there? No? Good. Here's your blood pressure gradient. Okay? So on the arterial side to the left, it's much higher than a venous side to the right. Overall, you have about a pressure gradient difference, about 93 milligrams of mercury, right? And what they're looking at right here is this, mean arterial pressure, okay? What do I mean by mean? What's mean referred to? The mean of something. Average. What are we going to average? What two pressure readings do we have? Systolic and diastolic. Okay, so the mean arterial pressure is really an average of diastolic versus systolic. Okay, so you have 120 over 80, and you're a longer period of time in the towards towards rela uh, relaxation towards diastole. So your mean arterial pressure should be a little bit closer to diastolic than it is to systolic. All right, so. Mean arterial pressure, in this case, 93, that's pretty normal, okay? Given someone who has 120 over 80 uh, textbook definition of blood pressure, all right? But then, as you can see, as you go from different places, different vessels, aorta, highest pressure, right? And as it goes down to the arteries, it goes, the mean arterial pressure starts to drop off, okay? It drops off arterioles, and then look at this steep slope right here. What happens? Why is there such a difference in pressure from this point to this point within the capillaries? 
what's happening in the capillaries? <clears throat> Exchange. What do we want the, the flow of blood to be in the capillaries to maximize exchange? Slow. So when pressure drops off, that also allows the blood to flow really slowly. Well, also within those capillaries, how, what's their diameter? Small, very thin, right? Microscopic. So it's such that the red blood cells have to stack up in one, they're only in the diameter of a red blood cell, right? So flow slows down. Pressure also has to go down, okay? To allow blood to flow through very uh, slowly to maximize exchange. And then on the other end, the venous end, you have very low pressure. So let me ask you a question. If there's that low pressure on the venous end, how is blood delivered back to the heart? Some of it depends upon this pressure gradient. Some of it will go, will be forced back through by the production of the arterial pressure. And then there's a couple other mechanisms that work with that. So muscle contracting is one of them. We'll talk about that. So the way your veins are, they overlie a lot of arteries, okay? So when the artery pumps through, it also will, will pump through the vein. And then when you're, they also underlie some skeletal muscle. So when you contract skeletal muscle, it will also pump blood back towards the heart. And then there's also a respiratory pump that also helps, okay? So venous return, okay? of the heart depends upon the pressure gradient, the skeletal muscle pump, what I just talked about, we'll talk about it in a second, okay? And the respiratory pump, okay? So the, the pressure gradient's there, still will push blood, but it's gonna be a lot less, all right? Because the gradient from capillaries to venous is so small, all right? Most of the blood is being pushed through the arterial side to the venous side. This is also why, because we have low pressure, why we have a buildup, all right, that, that venous blood reservoir we talked about last week, that's why, that also why this, that occurs, okay? So now, how do we get blood back? We, we, the, the pressure gradient's part of it, the other part of the skeletal muscle pump. Where, where the veins are, a muscle contracts, the vein is squeezed, and it returns blood back towards the body, or back towards the heart, okay? So it's pushed, valves prevent backflow, the blood is moved more quickly during exercise. When blood is moved more quickly during exercise, what does that do to venous return to the heart? What happens to venous return to the heart when blood is moved during exercise? When you exercise, what happens to venous return? It increases, right? More blood comes back to the heart. Now we get the heart starts to start to respond to that, increased stroke volume, increased cardiac cardiac output. Okay? And so and if you if you sit for a long period of time, blood will pool in the legs. Okay? Because you're sedentary. The the skeletal muscles aren't moving. Blood isn't being helped along that pathway. So blood will pool, okay? So how many of you have ever been on a long flight? More than six hours, okay? What do the, do the, what's the suggestion or likely recommendation? Walk around. Walk around, get up and walk around, okay? So that you don't allow that to happen. You get up and you walk down the aisle or whatever, so you don't allow blood to pool for a while. And the danger of that is what we call when we, it's in your book called a deep, a deep vein thrombosis. If blood pools long enough, it will clot, okay? So a lot of times, uh, uh, sometimes it happens, the clot forms in the legs and then can move to the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism, which can cause, could cause death, okay? So that's one of the recommendations to get up and walk around. So we have skeletal muscle pump, there's the, Right, so skeletal muscle contract and they push blood along the, vein, the venous pathway. The valves within the veins 
prevent backflow. Okay? The other part of this is a big part is the respiratory pump. Okay? There's a big skeletal muscle that changes the capacity of the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity every time you inhale and exhale. Okay? When you inhale, take a breath in, the diaphragm contracts and expands the size of the thoracic cavity. Okay? That puts pressure, okay, on the abdomen, decreases pressure in the thoracic cavity, and that change allows blood to pool. Right? It's kind of like sucking blood into the inferior vena cava because we've changed the pressure inside there. Now you exhale, and now the opposite happens. You lower pressure and release compression in the abdomen. That brings blood out of the, from the femoral veins and the, and the, and the uh, vein, veins within the um, abdomen into the inferior vena cava. And then this cycle goes on and on where you're kind of pumping blood out of the venous system in back to the heart. Okay, so what happens when you exercise in terms of respiration? You breathe faster. You breathe faster. What happens in terms of exercise when we talk about venous return to the heart? It's faster. It's faster. It's faster. It goes up. Part of that, this is part of the reason. Because increased respiration is going to get the blood to flow a little bit faster from the venous return, the, the venous reservoir, and you get more blood going back to the heart. Okay, so the skeletal, this respiratory pump, you take a deep inspiration, hold it, you're putting pressure within on those two big vessels, the, the superior vena cava and the, and the inferior vena cava, and it's actually causing blood to start to move, all right, within the large vessels, and that's the respiratory pump. Okay, questions? All right, so that's flow, blood flow, <clears throat> and what helps to move pressure, all right, and blood pressure. Blood pressure is directly re to re related to two things, okay? Blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance, okay? So we've talked a lot of this so far, cardiac output. Increased venous return to the heart by the respiratory pump, the venous pump, pressure gradients, et cetera, okay? And your mean arterial pressure, what that means and how that's pushing blood back to the heart, that's gonna affect cardiac output. What is peripheral resistance related to? What did I say a couple slides ago? Blood pressure, it, blood pressure relies on two factors. What? What were they? The pump and what else? The vessels, okay? So the pump, this is, cardiac output is all about the pump, what's coming out of the heart, okay? The vessel part is all peripheral resistance, okay? And resistance is, is a measure of the friction that blood encounters, okay? How well does the fluid move through that vessel? If it's not very well, that's a, that causes a problem, all right? If we can restrict it, and we can change things, all right? And we'll talk about, we'll pick up resistance on Wednesday, all right? So we'll pick up from there, we'll talk about peripheral resistance, etc. on Wednesday. I'll have your exam uh, grades posted sometime tomorrow, probably prior before 11 o'clock tomorrow. Okay?